Namaha Vancha Kalpa Tarubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhai Evaja Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare mm. We're studying Bhakti Vaibhav Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 2 Chapter Number 9 So we've we're up to ch text number 30 in the chapter number 9. Uh, Brahma had put questions to the personality of Godhead who had appeared to him. I remember in the last class I think it was done and Jaya Prabhu was saying that he'd heard somebody say that the personality of Godhead speaking there was Shirudakshayi Vishnu. But we don't see that anywhere in any of the commentaries. We should understand what happened when the Lord appeared to Lord Brahma, that Lord Brahma actually realized the spiritual world. It was Vaikuntha. He actually had a vision of this, the kingdom of God. It wasn't like he had to go to somewhere in the universe. So Lord Brahma actually, by dint of his penance and his... Uh, purification, he was able to please the Lord and the Lord revealed himself to him. We should understand the Lord is present everywhere and if he wants to appear to any devotee, he can do it. So the particular However, we heard how uh, Brahma not only saw the Lord, but he also saw the abode of the Lord, and he saw all the associates and everything. And there was detailed description. We read the descriptions of the Lord's abode and the associates and so on. So it was all fitting, the description of Vaikuntha. In Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary on this section, he describes that Lord Brahma had a vision of Maha Vaikuntha. I, I, I'm not quite sure what is the significance of the Maha Vaikuntha, but anyway, he, he does indicate it was Maha Vaikuntha. He doesn't say anything about Sweta Dweep or anything like that. He said, Lord Brahma actually had a vision of Maha Vaikuntha, and that's where he saw the personality of Godhead. So the Lord appeared. The Lord appeared to Lord Brahma, and uh, Lord Brahma had put questions to him, and that the four questions are listed there in the purport of text number 31. Those four questions are important. We should know these things. What are the forms of the Lord, both in matter and in transcendence? So in transcendence, the, the Lord has all kinds of spiritual forms. He's an antarup. And in matter, the whole material world is a form of the Lord. So that's the first question, which is answered in the first of the Chatur Sloki verses. And then the second question 
How are the different energies of the Lord working on these different energies are described by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. He says that Brahma is asking about how is the, what, what's the difference between Yoga Maya and Maya. In other words, the Lord's energies in this internal potency and in the external potency in the material world. So Lord Brahma wants to understand about these different energies of the, of the Lord, how they're working particularly for the sake of creation, maintenance and destruction, how the Lord is able to maintain, how, how he's able to manifest the whole universe and maintain it and then dissolve it. So this question is... Uh, you could say it's also Shristi Tattva, he wants to know about the create, but different energies, not only the material creation, he also wants to know about the spiritual energy of the Lord. And then the third question, how does the Lord play with the different energies? How does the Lord play? <laughs> Just like we all like to play, we like enjoyment, we like to have fun. So the Lord, he's the, the supreme enjoyer and he's also playing and enjoying th through his different potencies. And he is enjoying sometimes putting Mother Yashoda under Yoga Maya and sometimes Mahamaya, sometimes the Lord is revealing different things to different devotees. Just like we had Brahma, Vimohan, Leela, and at one point Krishna was showing Brahma all the cows and cowherd boys and calves. And then the next minute they all became Vishnu. And then the next minute they all became uh, they all became Krishna, or what was it? I can't remember now. Anyway, they all took different forms. They took different forms and completely bewildered the mind of Lord Brahma. So it was all done by the different energies of Krishna. He was enjoying playing with his different potencies. Yoga Maya. We say, oh, Yoga Maya, working. Uh, Bahulasva and, and Shrutadev. You know that story in the 10th Canto Krishna book? The Brahmana, Shrutadev, and the King Bahulasva. They were visited by Lord Krishna at the same time. And Lord Krishna expanded himself. Bahulasva thought, every, oh, they're all coming to see me. And Shrutadev thought, oh, they're all coming to see me. So at the same time, Lord Krishna was able to appear in both the homes simultaneously. And each person thought, Krishna's with me. And just, of course, like Krishna and Satyabhama, they each thought, Krishna is with me. Each of Krishna's wives was thinking, Krishna is so attached to me, he loves me the most. So this was Krishna playing with his different energies, uh, putting the devotees into different kinds of influence of the yoga maya. And we'll hear more, we have to go through the Prabhupada's purport, Prabhupada talks about some of the ways in which Krishna plays with the devotees. Uh, we'll discuss later. But then number four, uh, how... Oh, let me put on my glasses. How may Brahma be instructed to discharge the duty 
entrusted to him. No. So, the duty entrusted to Brahma was he has to create the bodies of the different living entities and he has to situate the planets also in the universe. So, he, he, how can he be entrusted to do it and not become influenced by false ego? He shouldn't think that, oh, I'm so intelligent, I'm so great, I'm so, I'm doing such an important service. He shouldn't be influenced by pride at all. He should remain a humble servant of the servant. So this fourth question, of course, is uh, very much related to the process of devotional service. So you can see the first, the first question is more in the line of Sambandha. And then the second and third question is dealing more with Prayojana. And the, third, the fourth question is Abhidaya, the process. Uh, so Prabhupada writes extensively on these purports. They're very important for us. He gives a lot of instructions, particularly he's warning us against speculation. We must be very careful to base everything on scriptural evidence and hear from the authorities. And even if you're in the position of Lord Brahma, then it's still very important that you do everything the right way. I'll just read this one quote here from the purport of text number 32. Prabhupada writes, the mystery is love of Godhead. Therein lies the main qualification for knowing the mystery of the personality of Godhead. And to attain the state of transcendental love of Godhead, regulative principles of devotional service must be followed. The regulative principles are called Vaidhi Bhakti or the devotional service of the Lord and they can be practiced by a neophyte with his present senses. Such regulative principles are mainly based on hearing and chanting of the glories of the Lord. So, although this is a very advanced level of uh, philosophy. We are studying the highest knowledge here. It's a very important level of philosophy, hearing this knowledge, the original instructions coming from the personality of Godhead. But we shouldn't think that, oh, now I'm an advanced devotee, now I don't need to practice Vaidhi Bhakti. That would be very foolish. We shouldn't think that, oh, I've surpassed the basic principles. I can just focus on uh, my own path of devotion to Krishna. We have to give full attention to the different principles of Vaidhi Bhakti, hearing regularly from authorized sources and Prabhupada particularly warns that the process of devotional service is not like going to a school teacher to get some information. You know, when you go to school and we're taking some course and you have teachers there, then, you know, their job is just to give you the information so that you can get through the exams, whatever is required. But the devotional science is not like that. 
that devotional science requires submissive inquiry and proper reception of the message also from the authorities, from the authorized speakers. We should always remember the, the most important principle is taking shelter of the spiritual teacher and offering all respects and uh, a spiritual teacher means one who's faithful to sadhu and shastra. So sadhu, shastra and guru, the three are parallel. Um, we need the three. Guru cannot be guru without the, uh, the support of sadhu and shastra. And sh sadhus are not sadhus unless they're also approved by guru and shastra. The, all three have to be there. They have to be in perfect harmony. Now, Prabhupada talks about the five principles for performing devotional service, panchanga bhakti. These things are so there in our morning program. Of course, we have the, the, the phenomena here in ISKCON that we're, off, we're presenting the Bhakti Shastri and Bhakti Vaibhav and often many of the people taking the classes are not actually very active in the devotional process in the temple. So they have to do everything at home. Whatever we do in the temple, people should do the same things at home. Just like we do Mongol Arti, we worship Tosi, we do Guru Puja. So these things are supposed to be done at home. If you're not doing them in the temple, you do them at home. And you don't hear Srimad Bhagavatam. Of course, nowadays you can hear Srimad Bhagavatam. We can get, record, we can hear on, online. I haven't been well this week. I've had a fever, but I had the opportunity to hear classes online. So it was ref refreshing for me to hear different devotees speak. Although I was not able to be physically present, I could be present through the internet. So that is bhakti yoga, that is vaidhi bhakti. We have to do these principles. All right, so then going on text 32, the Lord is replying to the questions of Brahma. He says, all of me, namely my actual eternal form and my transcendental existence, color, qualities and activities. Let all be awakened within you by factual realization out of my causeless mercy. So the causeless mercy, this is what we're always asking, give me mercy, give me mercy. So you can see the Lord is giving mercy to Lord Brahma here. And Prabhupada begins a purport, says the secret of success in understanding the intricacies of knowledge of the Absolute Truth is the causeless mercy of the Lord. It's by the mercy of the Lord that we can understand anything. Sometimes we can read these purports again and again and it just doesn't mean anything, it just doesn't make sense. But other times it's so clear, it just makes so, it's so, it's so uh, perfect. 
So we really need that mercy. We have to pray for that mercy in order to properly understand Srimad ba Bhagavatam. Although actually we can never fully understand Srimad Bhagavatam. But we do make an attempt. We're trying to understand Srimad Bhagavatam. And that attempt is what pleases Lord Krishna. As Prabhupada said, his causeless mercy to Lord Brahma, so that Brahma may have the factual realization of the Lord by his mercy only. And the qualification is not material. As Prabhupada said, even though illiterate, even though illiterate in the mundane sense, one can know the Lord automatically by the mercy of the Lord. <clears throat> we have examples of some of the Acharyas. For example, Gorkishur, as Babaji said, was illiterate, but he had perfect realization of the scriptures. And similarly, Haridas Thakur was perfectly realized in the scriptures. Although he was not brought up in the Hindu society, but he had perfect realization of everything. So then Prabhupada goes on to discuss about the different varieties of the transcendental body of the Lord and how the Lord is not limited in any way. He has so many different colors, sometimes blackish and white, and some are red and some are yellow. Those, of course, that's like the yoga avatars, there's those different colors. <coughs> and then you get also different categories of bodies of the Lord, uh, it's not necessarily they're going to be human form. You have the fish, you have the turtle, kurma, you have varaha, the boar, you have half lion, half man, almost inconceivably, not just lion, not just man, but half lion, half man. <coughs> One man came to see Srila Prabhupada. And he was actually a spiritual teacher, so-called spiritual teacher. And so he asked Prabhupada, can God be in the form of a snake? And Prabhupada told him, yes, if he wants. And so the man didn't know. He had to come and ask Prabhupada. And Prabhupada explained to him, yes, God can be in any form he likes. And, but when he's in the form of a snake, just as in Anantashesha, the king of snakes, it's transcendental, it's not material. One of the artists, the devotee artist, when she was painting the picture of Lord Varaha, as she wrote to Prabhupada, she said, you know, painting a picture of a boar, it's not very attractive. He said, do I, ha she asked Prabhupada, should I make him look attractive? And Prabhupada said, yes, you should, because he's, he's the Supreme Lord. So even when he comes as the Lord bore, he should be attractive. Of course, sometimes when people see the picture of Lord Varaha fighting Hiranyaksha, they apply their material conceptions and they think, they think Hiranyaksha is the, the good person and they think Lord Varaha is a demon. And they think, oh, who is this king fighting with this, this horrible beast? <laughs> Lord Varaha, of course, is Lord Bor. So they apply their material thinking they're thinking because Haranyaksha has a human form that, oh, he must be good. 
you're not able to understand that actually he's a demon, although he has a human form. So the Lord can appear in all different forms, but they're always transcendental. Mm -hmm. The important point Prabhupada stresses again and again is the Lord has a form. He's not formless. So that's, that's something very important which we really want to impress upon people that the Lord does have a form. And Prabhupada at the end of the purport says, the impersonal interpretation of the mundane uh, wranglers is completely refuted in this verse because it is clearly stated here that the Supreme Lord has his qualities, form, pastimes, and everything that a person has. All these descriptions of the transcendental nature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead are factual realizations by the devotee of the Lord. And by the causeless mercy of the Lord, they are revealed to the pure devotee and to no one else. So this is important. Again, we have to be pure. We want to understand the Lord. Now, we, we shouldn't think that, oh, pure, I'm not a pure devotee. And Prabhupada was asked how many pure devotees are on the planet. He thought, he said, well, all the members of the society are pure devotees. At least, that, at least the members of the society are pure devotees. If they're following the four principles and chanting, then they're doing pure devotional service. So it's not that we should think, oh, I, I'm not qualified, I'm not a pure devotee. No. If you're strictly following four principles, that is pure devotion. Daily we're chanting and hearing about Krishna. That is pure devotional service. Of course, there are many different levels of pure devotion. We have to go on. All right, so we come to text number 33, which is the first of the Chatur Sloki, Bhagavatam. Aham eva sam eva gre nanyadya sadasat param. Paschidaham yade tachcha yova shishyeta sosmiyaham. The Lord is saying, Brahma, it is I, the Personality of Godhead, who was existing before the creation when there was nothing but Myself. Nor was there the material nature, uh, causes of this creation. That which you see now is also I, the Personality of Godhead, and after annihilation what remains will also be I, the Personality of Godhead. So this is an important verse, and Prabhupada preaches very strongly in this purport against the impersonal philosophy. And he gives us many, many examples of how we can counter the impersonal philosophy. So I'd like to hear from you. I think you can go through this purport. If you haven't already done so, it will be good for you to just go through it just now and just make a note. Pick out the different examples which Prabhupada gives to help us to counteract to counter impersonal philosophy. When someone's speaking impersonal philosophy, you know, we're saying, oh, you know, it's I, it's, you know, because you can see in this verse, the impersonalists are very fond of this kind of verse. They say, yeah, there's only I, there's only the principal I. We're all I. We're all one. We're all I. 
And so Prabhupada discusses how to argue against this kind of philosophy because it's so prominent in society today. Impersonalism is so deep into the hearts of people and we need to be able to really root it out and make it very clear to people that this is not the correct idea. Right? So, you can see in the very first paragraph, Srila Prabhupada begins talking about the principle of I. And he said, yes, there's, there's the... Uh, there's a, cre there's a creator I and the created I. And Prabhupada goes on to discuss, there's a oneness, but there's a difference. There's, there's the Lord and there's Brahma. It's not that the Lord is talking to himself. There's a difference. There's the, the person who put the question and the person who's replying to the questions. It's not all one. Is this clear to everyone? The impersonalists will argue that because Brahma is an emanation from the Lord, so he is one with the Lord. But Prabhupada explains, yeah, there's the created and the creator. We have to understand the distinction. Difference in, <coughs> <coughs> difference in quality and difference in quantity one in quality. And then in the purport, Prabhupada then goes on to quote this famous verse, which is often used to present to impersonalists, Nityo Nityanam Chaitananas Chaitananam Eko Bahanam Yo Vidati Kama And the special feature of that verse is that that's a quotation coming from the Vedas. And the Vedas mean Shruti, because people may not ex accept Smriti. They may not be happy with the Smriti. They don't want to hear Bhagavad Gita. Oh no, Bhagavad Gita, no, that's, we don't accept that, you know. Oh, Purana, Srimad Bhagavatam, no, no. Give us some Vedic evidence. So in terms of Vedic authority, this is a very important sloka to establish the personal philosophy. Nityo nityanam chaitanas chaitan. Amongst all eternals, amongst all nityas is one supreme eternal. Amongst all conscious beings, there's one supreme conscious being. And that one Supreme Lord is providing the needs of everyone. So when the, when the Vedantists and the Jnanis hear this verse, then they crumble. They run. They have no response. They have no argument. Because they're demanding, quote, quote Shruti, let's hear from the Veda. And when we give them evidence from the Veda, then they cannot respond. Is it clear? Yes, guys. What are some other examples Prabhupada gives to defeat the impersonal philosophy? Example of Father. Yeah, Father. Yes, go ahead, tell us more. So, um, Prabhupada mentions that, like, a father gets a son and that son gives birth to other, you know, his sons. So they are all similar in one way that they are all human beings, but there is an eternal difference between the grandfather, the father and the rest of the sons. Yes. 
Great. Okay. Yes, we can go on. What are some other examples given in this purport? Prabhupada discusses they're both personalities. There's the Lord and there's Brahma. There's the predominator and the predominated. The predominator being the Lord and the predominated Lord Brahma. So they're both there. Just as the Lord is a person, Brahma is also a person. So Brahma is seen face to face, the Lord. Even, even after the annihilation of the material creation. So the Lord is not dependent on the physical manifestation of the world. The Lord's form is transcendental. It's not subject to any changes in time due to creation, maintenance and destruction. But the Lord always exists in all different phases of time. And Prabhupada quotes Vedic hymns, Vedic references from this. To support, again, Vedic references are important. It's more powerful if we can give references from Vedic authority. And Prabhupada does, he sees, quoting the Vedas. And then he says, Sripad Shankaracharya also comments. Then Srila Prabhupada argues that there is also Vaikuntha planets, there's a spiritual world and there's variety there. It's not just light, it's not just impersonal Brahman, but there's planets there and one can live there and the Lord does live there and he enjoys his pastimes there with his devotees and there's opulence also there. And there's even aeroplanes and many different facilities for different personalities so they can go and visit different places. We were reading about Lord Rama yesterday, uh, the other day, yesterday. <coughs> we were hearing about aeroplanes which can fly. Of course, Ravana had taken Pushpavaman and he was using it. And so in previous ages they had these things and certainly in the higher planets these things were there. And when we go to the Vaikuntas, it's there also, it's there to a much greater level. We know when it was time for Ajameel to go back to Godhead, the Vaikuntha aeroplane came to take him to go back, back to Godhead. And Dhruva Maharaj was transported in Vaikuntha aeroplane. So the spiritual world is not under any of the restrictions of the material world. The spiritual world is trans completely transcendental. Prabhupada writes here, 
the existence of the personality of Godhead implies the existence of the Vaikuntha Lokas, as the existence of a king implies the existence of a kingdom. People, if we ask people, do you believe in God? Of course, today we do find people quite ignorant and there are a number of people who don't believe in God. But there are still a number of people who do believe in God. And for those people who be they believe in God, but they don't know anything about Him. And they have no conception even about the Kingdom of God. I, I spent some time in the Philippines, and one time it was arranged that Srila Tamal Krishna Goswami was to meet one of the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church. Actually, his name was Cardinal Sin. He was a Filipino Chinese, and somehow he'd become cardinal in the Catholic Church. Catholicism is quite prominent in the Philippines. It's a Christian country because it was ruled by Spanish for some time and they converted everyone to Christianity. So he met with the cardinal and he asked the cardinal, he said, in your theology, what is the kingdom of God? What happens there? What goes on there? Because we don't know. It's very hard to understand from Christian And the Cardinal also said he didn't know. He said, that is not in our theology. We don't know. And some other people, I think, in the Islam religion, they see God is so big that you can't get far away from Him, to, far enough away from Him to see Him, because He's so big. <laughs> so like this, different traditions, they try to cover up the limited knowledge. But you can see in the Srimad Bhagavatam there is a lot of information. The descriptions we read about the four Kumaras entering the Kingdom of God. And then Prabhupada goes on to quote, in this purport he goes on to quote, places like in Srimad Bhagavatam where, where Maharaj Parikshit is asking about the cause of the creation, how does God create? <coughs> so Prabhupada is not just speaking but he's backing everything up with evidence from the scriptures. Whatever arguments Prabhupada is giving He's supporting it with scriptural evidence. And so not, not only is the Lord not annihilated, but you can see here it's mentioned here, even the devotees of the Personality of Godhead are not annihilated during the period of the entire annihilation of the material world. Not to speak of the Lord Himself. So that is the nature of the Lord that His devotees enjoy on an equal level. Just as the Lord, in, just as a king enjoys opulences and his different uh, servants and secretaries, they will enjoy on a similar level. And so also the devotees of the Lord enjoy on an equal level with the Lord. And Prabhupada compares the Lord to the king or the head of an executive state. He may not be seen in the government office, for he may be engaged in royal comforts. Yet it should be understood that everything is being done under, the, under his direction and everything is at his command. So Srila Prabhupada was in Detroit and he was with Ambarish and they were driving in Detroit. At one point they came past the Ford Motor Company and oh, they said, oh there's Ford, the Ford Motor 
factory. And uh, Brahmananda Swami turned to Ambarish and said, Is that where you work? And Prabhupada said, He does not work there, he is the proprietor. So he, Prabhupada was making the point that the owner doesn't work in the factory. He's the owner of the factory, he doesn't have to go to work. So the same way the king doesn't have to go and sit in the office every day. Sometimes he will go and do things, but only rarely. There will be different ministers and different secretaries and so on, they are all, who are all empowered to act on behalf of the king. So in a similar manner, Lord Krishna has, all his, has also his different deputies to take care of the affairs of the administration of the world. So people may say, oh, how could, how could it be, how could there be a God? How could he have a form which is eternal? And his planets are also eternal? So Prabhupada gives the example of the sun. Well, this, this, it's the same sun. The sun in the night may not be visible. But in the, the sun is visible whenever the sun rises. To the eyes of the inhabitants of a particular planet of the earth does not mean that the sun has no form. So in the same people are saying, oh God has no form, we can't see him. If he's really God, then we should be able to see him. But at night you don't see the sun. But in the daytime, when the sun rises, the sun reveals himself. People want to see the form of the Lord, and other times Prabhupada would say, you have, to, you have to be qualified. A qualification to see God, you have to love God. That is the qualification. If you're just going to criticize, if, you, if he's going to appear before you, you're just going to tell him, oh, you can't be God. Why should he waste his time to come and show himself before less intelligent, foolish people? So Prabhupada is giving us many arguments here in how to present the Krishna conscious philosophy to those who are faithless and atheistic. And actually impersonalists, they're also less intelligent people. Although they study Vedanta, they're actually less intelligent people. They, they're armchair philosophers. You may be a member of the Ramakrishna mission or the Vedanta society or whatever. They're studying so many Upanishads. They're studying the Vedas but they don't understand the purpose behind the Vedas. So they are described in the Bhagavad Gita as Vedavada Rata. They are simply mouthing the words of the Vedas. They are simply, simply repeating the words of the Vedas without any understanding of the real purpose behind the Vedas. Because Krishna says, by all the Vedas I am to be known. Indeed, I am the author and I am the compiler of the Vedas. And they call themselves Vedanta Society. Veda means knowledge and Anta means the end of knowledge. What is the end of knowledge? The end of knowledge, they say, is just to realize you are simply, a, that you are simply one with the one Brahman. So we say that is less intelligent. Prabhupada gives more examples about government offices. He talks about the head of the government. There must be some head in charge of the state. Governments are not impersonal. You can say, oh, nobody's the, nobody's the prime minister. Nobody's the president. No, there are leaders. There's, every, there's somebody in charge, the head of the government office. There's always somebody there. 
in the same way in terms of the Lord's creation, there must be somebody there, somebody in charge. And Prabhupada writes, both the impersonal and personal forms of the Lord are acceptable, as mentioned in the revealed scriptures. So it's not that the Lord is not impersonal, but he is both personal and impersonal. We have to understand that, that the Lord has all these features. Brahmeti, Paramatmeti, Bhagavan Iti, Shabhyate. But Prabhupada says one should have the ultimate realization, not in the impersonal Brahman, but in the personal feature of the Absolute Truth. Why is that? Why do you think that? Why should we have the ultimate realization of the, of the personal feature? Anyone can respond? Hare Krishna Maharaj, because in personal uh, features only we can have a set of melodies. It is not possible uh, in the impersonal feature. What, what are you saying? In the personal feature only we can have the exchange of different mellows, the rasas. Like we can have a, a relations, one-to-one -one relation where, where we have a chances of serving him. While in personal form, uh, in, in, in personal feature there is no exchange of uh, uh, relationship, mellows. Okay. Yeah, good. That personal feature is the basis of the impersonal feature. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes uh, Yes, what's the verse in Bhagavad Gita? Krishna says, I am the basis of the impersonal Brahman. Yes, right. Brahmano hi pratistaham. The basis, all right? Krishna does not say, um, <coughs> Bhagavan hi pratistaham. No. no, it's Bhagavan is the basis of the Brahman. The Brahman is coming from the Bhagavan feature. So we have to understand that. And then, the, of course, the impersonalists, they have their own examples which they like to give. One of the examples which they like to give is the example of the sky within the pot and outside the pot. And the sky within the pot, when the pot is broken, they, they say then the sky within the pot merges with the sky outside of the pot. So, how will you respond to this question? Who can respond? What will you answer? The impersonalists like to give this argument that, oh, sometimes they, get, sometimes they talk about all the rivers flow into the sea to become one with the sea, and the sky within the pot becomes one with the sky outside the pot. So, how can you defeat this argument? Because in the pot we are seeing the shadow. So, uh, shadow is not the real. So, it is only the external energy and when it, we break, it is meeting with the external energy. So, that way we say that sun sign. So, sun is different than the sun sign. Now, the thing is through the sun sign we are seeing the shadow. So basically at impersonal level we are only at external level. We are not have any understanding of the Lord Himself. So mm -hmm. somebody else? Mm -hmm. Maharaj um I think I, I think as far as I remember Prabhupada said that we are not the sky. We are parts and parcels of Krishna, so we are um, similarly in uh, the example of rivers when they flow down to the 
ocean then we are um, there are also living entities within that river and uh, yes so they, you're closer to the answer Mataji yes Prabhupada points out that in giving examples in giving analogies the best analogies, they have to have some comparison, they have to have some relation to each other. We are not like sky in the po Sky is simply matter, dull matter, with no consciousness. And similarly, the water in the rivers is it's simply elements of matter. But we are living entities. So we cannot compare the living entities to simply dead matter. So the the better example is there, as Maharaj says, just like in the rivers there are aquatics, living entities which dive deep in the ocean. They come from the rivers and they swim into the ocean and they keep their individuality. So we cannot compare living entities to just air within a pot. It's not proper example. It's a, a stupid example which impersonalists sometimes present. So we say yes, you have to understand there is a oneness between the Lord and the living entities. The one, there's a oneness in quality and a difference in quantity. And we keep our individuality. Just like the living entities are there in the airplanes and in the different insects and birds and so on, they're flying in space. They have their individual identity. And they keep that individuality. Each of them are living entities, they're spirit souls. And they will give up one body, they'll go on to take another body. And so we, we're not very satisfied to hear about pots or about rivers flowing into the ocean, becoming one. All right, and then just to read more of Prabhupada's purport. Therefore, this verse, aham evatham, never indicates anything other than the Supreme Lord. And one should therefore follow the path of the Brahma Sampradaya or the path from Brahma to Narada to Vyasadeva. Hmm. And just at the end, one should be attached to the root of everything, the root of everything rather than bewildered by the branches and leaves. That is the instruction given in this verse. All right, is it clear now, this verse, first verse? Any questions? You want to take a five minute break now? Okay, we'll take five minute break.
Hare Krishna. Okay, so we'd like to continue again with our Bhakti by Bab. Okay, so I've, I've finished covering tech, the first of the Chatur Sloki. We'll go on to uh, 34 and 35. First of all, 34 is like this describing about the second question. Brahma wanted to know about the Lord, the Lord's energies. So the Lord replies, text 34, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy. That reflection which appears to be in darkness. That's pretty clear. In other words, if we're thinking something is separate from Krishna, then that's, that's the illusion. It's the illusory energy, that's the maya. <coughs> so Prabhupada in the purport talks, nothing can exist without the Lord. It should be known that the illusory energy, illusion, thinking that that is also an energy of the Lord. So the, the illusion is not false. That, that's the point which is, Prabhupada wants to establish and which the Lord himself is establishing to Brahma that to think there's something separate from him, that, that's not on. In the purport, Prabhupada writes about the Lord's Devi Maya or Maha Maya. So the right conclusion of dovetailing everything in relationship with the Lord is called Yoga Maya. <coughs> are the energy of union and the wrong conception of detaching a thing from its relation is called the Lord's Daivi Maya. So those two potencies are there and Prabhupada discusses these in great detail. You know, some people have the philosophy that we're not real, you don't exist, I don't exist, everything is illusion. So that, that illusion then, that is also created by Krishna. Actually, we're all eternally personalities. won't spend too much time on the second verse because the most interesting part comes in the third. But Prabhupada does discuss about materialistic people and how advancement of science is just another covering. Oh, he discusses about the two effects of maya, the throwing and the covering, that should be noted, two effects of maya, throwing, we're thrown into the material world, into the pool of ignorance, and then we're covered. So the first is the throwing and then the covering, the covering of the soul, we become more covered 
and some people are more and more covered. Some people the covering is slight and some people the covering is very heavy. So that covering, that is the ignorance where people are totally absorbed in the body, they're totally ignorant about any kind of process of self-realization. We have no, under, no consideration about the goal of life, about higher purposes in life. So that is maya, that's a covering, different coverings, everyone's covered. Some people, we're working to remove the covering. We say ceto darpanam marjanam, clean, cleaning the mirror of the mind, trying to remove that covering from the heart. So that's in the important point in that purport there. Uh, then Prabhupada does make some points here just at the end of the purport of 34. No one can make a solution of the darkness of ignorance simply by the reflection of light. Similarly, no one can come out of material existence simply by the reflected light of the common man. One has to receive the light from the original light itself. The reflection of sunlight in the darkness is unable to drive out the darkness. We want, we want to come to the light. Vedic scriptures always speak about that. Tamasima jatir gama. Don't stay in the dark. Come to the light. So, what, knowledge means light, is like light. But where to get that knowledge? You, you don't get it just uh, by mundane means. It's not just like some school teacher or some information which you pay some fees and you get the knowledge. Although sometimes people advertise like that, that pay the fee and we'll make you God. So they have, they have no real understanding about what is the position of God. But how to get the real light? One has to take shelter of the light, as in the Bhagavad Gita, or Srimad Bhagavatam, and not the reflective personalities who have no touch with the Lord. So that's the very important point. We need to be connected to the authorized source, the authorized channels. Then we can get the proper light, the proper knowledge. Otherwise we just simply remain bewildered. Although People may be looking for some kind of knowledge, some kind of spiritual progress, but until they actually come to the association of devotees, they're not going to be fortunate. They're not going to have to get anywhere. I'll go on to the third verse. Right, text number 36. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 35, sorry, 35. O Brahma, please know that the universal elements enter into the cosmos and at the same time do not enter into the cosmos. Similarly, I myself also exist within everything created and at the same time I am outside of everything. So, this verse is describing how Lord Krishna plays with his different energies, how he's uh, performing his different functions, how he's created everything. Prabhupada gives the example that everything in the world, material world, mm -hmm. it's all made up of elements, of the mountains, the buildings, the countryside, everything, it's all made up of the elements of the material nature. But before these things could be created, the elements must have been created first. 
if we were to analyze, you know, where, where, does the, where did everything come from, we can break down the elements of the material nature and we come to the five basic elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether. All right, the cement, the glass, everything, it's all coming from earth, water, fire, air and ether. This is the basic elements of material creation. But before, before the, these things came about, they had to be created also. So, Prabhupada says, uh, in both circumstances, they entered the cosmos and also didn't enter. So the elements of the creation were there, but at the same time they were not there. They, they also had to be created. In the describing the creation in the uh, Sukadeva Swami and also in third canto you hear there's primary creation where the elements are created and then secondary creation. So the primary creation is the work of Vishnu, secondary creation is the work of Brahma. Uh, there's the internal and the external energy. The internal energy is eternally there, it's eternally manifest, it's not subject to decay. Prabhupada quotes Brahma Samhita about the nature of the Lord's spiritual energy and how he's present everywhere in everything and he discusses about how it's very difficult for people to understand that the Lord can be everywhere and in everything and at the same time he is also a person. So Prabhupada explains the secret that to actually understand that this real principle it requires, as written here, this vision is a real mystery of spiritual knowledge. The real mystery of spiritual knowledge. Oh, he, herein lies the mystery of his transcendental knowledge. This mystery is transcendental love of Godhead. And one who is surcharged with such transcendental love of Godhead can without difficulty see the personality of Godhead in every atom and every movable and immovable object. So like that, we can un we, Prabhupada has described the important love of God. If you don't have love for God, you don't have that kind of faith in the Lord, then you won't be able to understand His inconceivable potencies. So this is important. This is the, why we study the, the Srimad Bhagavatam from the beginning. You have to hear the first two cantos very carefully and develop that strong faith in the Lord that he has inconceivable potencies. As you understand the in more, as we understand that he has these inconceivable potencies, at the same time we want to develop love for him. So we should become more and more overwhelmed by his attractive features, his wonderful pastimes, his inconceivable qualities. This should all become more and more captivating to the mind of the devotees, that we become more and more absorbed in thinking of the Lord. And then, when we hear about how the Lord does all of these things, then it's very easy. Just like the famous story about the cobbler and the Brahman, the cobbler didn't have any problem to hear about the inconceivable potencies of the Lord. It was a Brahmana who had the problem. So that love, that is the important qualification. And we have to develop that love. We have to develop that love through service. We all have the ability to love someone or something we show it by service, the more we engage in service. And the more we're engaged in service, 
then the more the Lord reciprocates with the devotees. And Prabhupada describes here in the purports mentioned here, he said, uh, and you can see here in this purport, factually, the spiritually developed person is able to have the television of the kingdom of God always reflected within his heart. That is the mystery of knowledge of the personality of Godhead. And earlier on also it was mentioned uh, in the Vaikuntha Loka is far, far beyond the material cosmic manifestation are being factually televised in the heart of the devotee. Just like they televise Mayapur classes, <coughs> or you, you want to listen to Bhagavatam, there are so many different centers, they all have their Zoom cameras. <coughs> you can hear Bhagavatam from Juhu or Chaupati or Pune or you can hear from Punjabi Bhag or you can hear from Vrindavan. You don't have to just hear Mayapur. There's so much variety, so much choice. So the Lord he is broadcasting the news of Vaikuntha, the pastimes of Vaikuntha, into the hearts of his pure devotees. And the pure devotees, they're actually engaging in the pastimes of the Lord. They're so absorbed in thinking of Krishna, they actually enter into Krishna's pastimes. Lord Krishna reveals to them by His mercy, mercy due to their pure love. <coughs> Pra Prabhupada adds, however, this is very difficult, however, for the layman to understand without knowledge of the mystery of devotional service, as it is very difficult to know the potency of touchstone. The potency of touchstone, of course, you know what touchstone is, right? Anything you touch turns to gold. Anything you touch can fulfill your, your spiritual desires. So it's inconceivable that there is such a thing as touchstone. And similarly, for the layman, it's difficult to understand this mystery of devotional service. It requires submission and surrender. You have to understand the Lord can do anything He wants. He has inconceivable powers and if He wants to reveal Himself in this way to the hearts of His devotees, He can do it. And no one can say, oh no, I don't believe. No, it's certainly possible. So this is the Yoga Maya, where the Lord is acting on the hearts of His devotees. He's revealing Himself to His devotees through different rasas. These rasas are actually being experienced at every moment. So Prabhupada writes, of, out of all kinds of perfection attained by the process of knowledge, yoga, perfection and devotional service is the highest of all 
and the most mysterious also, even more mysterious than the eight kinds of mystic perfection attained by the process of yogic performance. So, of course, this is the highest level of devotional service. We are simply hearing about such things. And they're being described to us here in the second canto by the grace of the Supreme Lord through the questioning of Lord Brahma. Because Lord Brahma had actually seen, he had actually had the darshan of the Lord, he had the vision of Vaikuntha, so he was able to inquire about all of these things. How does the Lord play with his energies? He plays by revealing himself, and Prabhupada quotes a verse from Bhagavad Gita, Tesham satatan yuktanam bhajitam pritipurvikam dada buddhi yogam pam yena mama priyat. To those who are constantly devoted and worship me with love, I give the understanding by which they can come to me. It's not a mystery to the devotees. And this is a fact. Of course, you have to, we have to qualify. I was listening to uh, His Grace Rameshwara Prabhu. He was, he, he's a very, very senior disciple of Srila Prabhupada. And he had a lot of very intimate association with Srila Prabhupada during the time of Srila Prabhupada's manifest presence. So he was giving class the other day and I was listening to his class and he was talking about an incident which happened in Los Angeles. He had actually been, Rameshwar in the past, he'd been a GBC, he'd even been a sannyasi at one point. He, he gave up sannyas and entered into household life. But uh, he'd been a GBC and he was one of the directors of uh, the Los Angeles Temple. He was very much involved with the Los Angeles Temple and book distribution worldwide. He had uh, spent a lot of energy in promoting book distribution. So he was describing anyway that at one point in Los Angeles there was a group of senior devotees who started to meet together and they were, they decided they just wanted to read about Mad Madhurya Ras. They just wanted to read the pastimes of Krishna and the gopis. They didn't want to read other things. They would just read Madhurya Ras. And their thinking was that if we just read about Krishna and the gopis and Madhurya Ras, then at the end of the life, we will think about that and we will achieve that destination and we will become gopi. But when Srila Prabhupada heard about this, he said, this is nonsense. He said, this is not true at all. He said, you cannot choose the rash you want to be. It's not for us to decide, I want to be a gopi. That's not how it happens. You cannot dictate yourself to Krishna that I want to be in this ras with you. You have to depend on Krishna, if Krishna wants to, to accept you in that mood. It's not for you to be dictating to Krishna. And in this way Prabhupada completely defused this whole thing which became known as the Gopi Bhava Club. So I thought it was very interesting. I'd never heard it quite explained so well as Rameshwar Prabhu explained it the other day. But he explained so clearly how it's a material desire that we are imposing our desire onto Krishna. And that is not devotional service. 
We have to have the mood to be the servant, to want to serve Krishna. That is required. <coughs> If Krishna wants to appear in your heart, Krishna can do it. But you have to be worthy. We cannot, you know, we, we do get people who some often come by and they say, Oh, Krishna spoke to me last night. And Krishna, one man used to come to our temple in Calcutta and he would say, Krishna told me, you know, he said, I shouldn't get my daughter married to this, other, this one man. He said, I should get this. my daughter, she should marry another person. <laughs> you know, it's so stupid, you know. But the man was, you know, he was so convinced that Krishna's coming and speaking to me. And so you, you get these kind of things. People think Krishna's their servant rather than the simply being the servant of Krishna. Okay. <coughs> so then the text number 36 is the reply to the fourth question of Lord Brahma. Right? What was the fourth question? Who remembers? That he may not become proud during, while he creates. Mm. Well, that's... That how Brahma may discharge his duties? Yes. Uh, mm. Text 35 answers the question of 20, 28. And text 34 answers text 27. Okay, fourth question. The fourth question is... Uh, instruction for obtaining the desired goal. What, what is the instruction of the Lord to achieve the desired goal? This is how it's described in the commentary of Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. How is it described in Prabhupada's purport? Maharaj, in uh, verse 31 it is said that Krishna will not how may Brahma be instructed to discharge the duty entrusted to him? Okay. So the, the duty entrusted to him, we should understand the duty entrusted to him is not just simply only creation, but his duty is also to achieve the desired goal. And just like all of us, you know, sometimes we become, oh, I have to do this, I have this duty, I have that duty. But our real duty is to become Krishna conscious. So similarly also Lord Brahma, his duty is to be Krishna conscious, to achieve the desired goal. That is actually what Brahma was really asking about. Not just simply, how do I do the service? Yes, yeah. yeah, certainly those things are there, that he doesn't want to become proud, he doesn't want to be influenced by false ego and so on. But the ultimate goal is that he will achieve that pure love, that complete, pure, unadulterated love for the Supreme Lord. And so the response is given that a person who is searching after the Supreme Absolute Truth, the Personality of Godhead, must certainly search for it up to this in all circumstances, in all space and time, and both directly and indirectly. So there's an extensive purport here, and Prabhupada gives some wonderful uh, 
quotations and evidences from the scriptures about the nature of devotional service, how devotional service can be performed by everyone, everywhere. There's no exclusion, right? We cannot say, oh, you're not qualified. Everyone's allowed at every stage of life, right? Who performed devotional service in the womb? Narada Muni. Yeah, Prahlad. Yeah. Parikshit Maharaj. Parikshit and Prahlad in the womb. And who were the devotees in childhood? Jeeva Goswami. Jeeva Goswami, yeah, throughout his life, devotee, yeah. But particular Dhruva Maharaj in childhood. And then youthhood. Who's the devotee? I don't know. The example is given Ambarish Maharaj. What about at old age? Who was the one who became devotee at old age? Ajamil. Well, Ajamil was. It was not 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 just old age. Ajamil was at death. But who was in old age when he became devotee? Dhritarashtra. Yes, sir. Right? And then Ajamila at death. And who became devotee after death? After he'd gone to heaven? Ajamila. Ah. I just said Ajamila, he became devotee at death. But this one had gone to heaven. And then he'd, he'd actually gone to heaven, then he became devotee. Who was that? Chitra Ketu. Chitra Ketu. Yes, Chitra Ketu. So, in every condition of life, you can see, you can become devotee. Nobody can say, oh, no, I cannot be devotee. Some people say, I'm too young, let me enjoy first. Somebody else says, I'm too old. No, there's no material consideration in devotional service. So at, at all space and time, both directly and indirectly, become a devotee directly or become a devotee indirectly, what does it mean? Who's the, who's the direct devotees and who's the indirect devotees? Anyone? No, it's direct devotee who is directly discharging the process of bhakti and indirect devotees who maybe take up the process of jnanam and other yogic forms or maybe worship demigods, like first worship demigods and then are directed towards the Supreme Lord. Yes, yeah. good, yes. Some people come to bhakti indirectly. Sometimes people come by serving devotees. By Agyata Sukriti, they get bhakti. Narada Muni was serving great sages as a young boy. And got their blessings. So everyone is free to to understand scriptures, but one still requires the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master. Spiritual master in the bona fide disciplic succession never claims to be the Lord. Such a spiritual master is not... Although such a spiritual master is greater than the Lord, and then Prabhupada explains, how is it the spiritual master is greater than the Lord? In the sense that he can deliver the Lord to, by his personally realized experience. 
So that's a nice point which Prabhupada has made there in the purport, that by his own experience he's delivering the Lord. Okay, and then Prabhupada talks about there are so many interpretations of scriptures, different people like to interpret the Bhagavad Gita, give their own ideas, they don't give the real understanding. Then Prabhupada refers to the fifth canto fifth chapter. He often quotes this verse five five five, five five six, speaking about the condition of the living entity. How he's suffering different kinds of miseries in human life. The miseries of the material body, his mind overwhelmed by the pains. But he continues in material life, birth after birth. The only way they can, the living entity to, can hope to be freed from his condition is to develop attachment for the Supreme Lord, to change his condition and become attached to the, the transcendental name of the Lord and hearing the glories of the Lord. So Jiva, Srila Jiva Goswami therefore comments on the words Sarvata Sarvada in the sense that the principles of bhakti yoga or devotional service to the Lord are apt in all circumstances. Bhakti yoga is recommended in all the revealed scriptures. It is performed by all authorities. It is important in all places. It is useful in all causes and effects. And as far as the revealed scriptures are concerned, he quotes from other, from the Skanda Purana, so on. So the universal nature of devotional service, how everywhere it is recognized as the supreme process. There is no disputing position, the potency of devotional service. The devotional service of the Lord with perfect knowledge through the training of a bona fide spiritual master is advised for everyone, even if one happens not to be a human being. <laughs> so that's an interesting point, you see. And can you think of some living entities who are not human beings who do devotional service? Hanuman. Yeah. Yeah. Who else? Well, huh? Quirrell, who served Lord Ramachandra. Garuda. Garuda, Gajendra. Hanuman, Gajendra. Okay, good. Who did you say, Puran? Squirrel, squirrel. Oh, the squirrel. Squirrel, okay. <laughs> all right, so different living entities, they're all doing devotional service. The dog in Chaitanya Lila, Shivananda saying, give mercy to the dog. And here in Prabhupada's purport he said, even the worms, birds and beasts are assured of elevation to the highest perfectional life. If they are completely surrendered, 
to the transcendental loving service of the Lord. To what, so what to speak of the philosophers amongst the human beings? Therefore, there is no need to seek properly qualified candidates for discharging devotional service to the Lord. Well, that's an interesting quote. I don't know what temple managers think about this. There's no need to, you know, some people in charge of the temples, they say, bring qualified people. But here Prabhupada said, it's no question who's qualified, who's not. Anybody, bring them. Let everyone have the chance. We had one young boy, I was staying in the Kamkara temple, and there was, there was a young boy, he was living in the street, and he was coming to temple sometimes and something chanting, and one of the devotees took an interest in him and befriended him, and they arranged to, with the mother to send him to Mayapur. So for some time he went to Mayapur and he was in the Gurukula there. He did, didn't stay for very long. Mother, after some time, wanted him back. But for some time he was there in Mayapur, staying with the devotees. So he got the opportunity, he got the benefit to be a devotee for some time. But Prabhupada said, thus any person, whatsoever, whosoever he or she may be, even the fallen woman, the less intelligent laborer, the dull mercantile man, or even a man lower than all these, can attain the highest perfection of life by going back home, back to Godhead, provided he or she takes shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord in all earnestness. So this is the main point. The, the sincerity, that sincere desire to simply give oneself to the service of Krishna. And Prabhupada said, the all-powerful Lord can purify the devotee of all sinful reactions, just as the sun can remove sins. Okay, so that's well known. Huh? So then Prabhupada encourages the devotees, do devotional service. Whatever you do, do it for Krishna. You don't have to worship anyone else, just worship Krishna. What, even you have material desires, simply worship Krishna. If even for a moment remembrance of Vasudeva is missed, that is the greatest loss, that is the greatest illusion, that is the greatest anomaly. Oh, oh what happened? Krishna. Ajamila, oh, that, that, we mentioned all that, so yeah. So then Prabhupada gives different points which are uh, helpful for the practice of spreading devotional service, giving more people the opportunity for devotional service. Prabhupada lists different points. He talks about, first of all, even the one is not, not well versed in the Vedas of scriptures, that's okay. He is considered to be the lowest. Even if he is considered to be the lowest, if one is not a devotee, he is considered to be the lowest. In the Garuda Purana, 
Padma Purana, the same is repeated. What is the use of Vedic knowledge? So Prabhupada is just emphasizing the importance of bringing out some devotion, giving people some devotion, helping people to just awaken a little devotion. And that's our Krishna consciousness movement, that we try to give mercy to people give them as much opportunity as we can to come into the Krishna Consciousness Movement, to do devotional service. And Prabhupada knew, Prabhupada knew that it was going to be difficult for many of the devotees to maintain Krishna Consciousness. Although Prabhupada initiated them, and even some of them were initiated as sannyasis, Prabhupada took that risk. He knew it was going to be very difficult. And Prabhupada gave the example, he said, just like in a war, in a war there's going to be, there's going to be deaths. People are killed, being killed and dying. And so he understood that in the fight against Maya, there's going to be victims, the people are going to fall down, they're going to have problems. But Prabhupada wanted that, just give people the chance to do some devotional service. If they just have that opportunity, they did some devotional service, that's the greatest benefit. I know a number of devotees in that position, some of them were very leading devotees for some time. And somehow, some people in, in a short number of years and others in a long time, even after many years, sometimes they get into difficulties. They get spiritual problems. But they did a lot of devotional service. And that's the important point. That was what Prabhupada was concerned about giving everybody the chance that they can all do some service for Krishna. You can see the example uh, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, there was the pastime of Chota Haridas, and Chota Haridas had deviated from the position, he'd made some fault in the behavior of a sannyasi. And Lord Chaitanya refused to allow him to come into his association. But when Prabhupada's sannyasis, when they had some difficulties, Prabhupada didn't, he didn't tell them to go and jump in the Trivani, he didn't tell them to go and do like Chota Haridas. He didn't reject them. Rather, he gave them the opportunity to go on and do more devotional service. And you can read in the eighth canto about Gajendra. He said, Gajendra was weak in the water. He was not properly situated. And so sometimes devotees have to be rightly situated to do devotional service. And Prabhupada was concerned for that. Let people be rightly situated to do devotional service. It doesn't matter what ashram, what colour of cloth they're in or whatever. Let them do devotional service. Let them use their intelligence and their skills to do some nice service for Lord Krishna. And in this way they can progress to the ultimate goal. In Bhakti Yoga, it's allowed like that, but in other yoga processes, it's very strict. Other yoga processes, Jnana Yoga, and, and Karma Yoga, you know, you know like Maharaj Nriga, he did Karma Yoga, he got problems. You do Jnana Yoga, you go off to the impersonal Brahman. But if you do Bhakti Yoga, Even a little advancement made, 
saves you from the greatest danger. And Prabhupada writes about this, he said, even if they are adopted, there is every chance of discrepancies in discharging the particular type of functions. Discrepancies in the execution of karmakanda rituals, or discrepancies in explaining philosophical points. But adoption of the transcendental devotional service of the Lord has no limit, nor is there fear of falling down. Mm -hmm. So this is an important, very important point in understanding the power of bhakti. But th this is not there in the other yoga systems. It's only in bhakti that there's no danger of falling down. And we, we see it. We see devotees, you know, that they had difficulties, but they're able to go on and come back and do devotional service. So these four slokas were first given by Krishna himself. They're not just coming from any ordinary person, but they're the words of Lord Krishna himself. And one who has, one who has no approach to the Lord in his personal feature can rarely understand the purport of Srimad Bhagavatam without being taught by the Bhagavatas in the disciplic succession. Uh -huh. So in this way we're explaining the answers of the Lord to the four questions by Brahma, Lord Brahma. Let's go on, text number 37. I would like to go on because we'll try to finish this week if possible. We just have, after this chapter, there's just one more chapter. Okay. So, text 37. O Brahma, just follow the conclusion by fixed concentration of mind and no pride will disturb you, neither in the partial nor in the final devastation. So, the, the Lord is encouraging Brahma that do your duty, fix your mind. The student will rise to the plane of complete knowledge, which will be exhibited. The development of knowledge will be he becomes detached from the world of sense gratification. Are, we can ask people, are you, are, sometimes people ask us, are, I'm, how do I know I'm making progress in Krishna consciousness? We can understand how much we are progressing by how much we are becoming detached from thoughts of sense gratification. How much you are allowing your mind to still dwell on thoughts of sense gratification. That is our attachment to the material world. The more we are able to absorb our mind in thinking of the Lord, then the more we are making progress in Krishna consciousness. So because Brahma was de dedicated, devoted like that, so the Lord spoke the Srimad Bhagavatam to him.
So we should understand the Lord revealed Vaikuntha, the spiritual world, to Lord Brahma. He revealed it to him. And as he revealed it to Lord Brahma, he can reveal it to any of the pure devotees. They, Prabhupada would often say, I am not in New York, I am in Vrindavan. Prabhupada was always thinking of Vrindavan. <coughs> and Vrindavan, not just a place on the map. Vrindavan. Vrindavan means the Lord's own abode. Prabhupada writes, therefore Lord Krishna is the original form of the Supreme Lord. This is also clear from his instructions. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is Lord Krishna and not directly Narayan or the Purusha avatars. Or the Purusha avatars, you hear that? Which are subsequent manifestations. Therefore, Srimad Bhagavatam means consciousness of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Lord Krishna and Srimad Bhagavatam is the sound representation of the Lord. Conclusion is that Srimad Bhagavatam is the science of the Lord, in which the Lord, his abode, are perfectly realized. Sukadeva Goswami said to Maharaj Parikshit, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Hari, after being seen in his transcendental form, instructed Brahmaji, the leader of the living entities, disappeared. Maharaj, you're on mute, Maharaj. Oh, really? Okay, you can hear me now. All right, so Sukadeva Goswami is speaking now. The Lord has disappeared. The Supreme Personality of God had appeared to Brahma. Now he's disappeared. And Brahmaji is remaining. So he has to continue the orders, the work done. It's a fact that the Lord can appear wherever he likes, in whatever form he chooses. Text 39, on the disappearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari, who is the object of transcendental enjoyment of the senses of devotees, Brahma, with folded hands, began to create the universe, full with living entities, as it was previously. So Brahma takes up service, engaging in service. Some people get good service, very Some people are able to simply, you know, somebody's cleaning the temple, somebody's offering worship to the deities. There's no difference. The Lord doesn't make a distinction between the service. It's the mood in which we perform the service. That is important. And Prabhupada discusses about this, our senses, that the original purpose of the senses, all of our senses, they were meant for the service of the Lord. And Prabhupada quotes evidence from the scriptures that the tongue is meant to describe the glories of Krishna, the ears are meant for hearing the topics of Krishna, our eyes are meant for seeing the form of the Lord, our legs are meant for going to the holy places. Everything is given to us for the service of Krishna. 
But we have this idea, you know, we use everything for our own sense gratification. Prabhupada writes, plucking out of the eyes is no treatment. He's, probably, he's talking about how the, for the impersonalists, they want to stop all sense activities. Their, their process is negation of the senses. Stop all sensory activities. Don't see anything, don't hear anything, don't speak anything. You know that? Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. So that's the impersonal mood. They don't know what is the proper use of the senses. So Prabhupada gives an example. He said, just like you have a disease in the eye, you don't pluck out the eye, you, you get rid of the disease. You want to keep the eyes, you just want to get rid of the disease. You know, sometimes you get corneas in the eye, you go for surgery and then they remove the cornea and you can see again. So disease is based on the process of sense gratification and liberation from the disease condition is the re-engagement of the senses to see the beauty of the Lord, to hear His glories and to act on His account. Thus Brahma created the universal activities again. So very nicely described. Text 40, thus once upon a time, the forefather of living entities Lord Brahma situated himself in acts of religious, of regulative principles, des desiring self-interest for the welfare of all living beings. So, we're hearing about Lord Brahma taking up his work, Narada always ready to serve, strictly followed the instructions of his father, he's mentioned by his mannerly behavior, meekness, and sense control. Very important qualities being stressed here. So Narada is being appreciated for that. Narada pleased his father very much, desired to know about the energies of Vishnu and the master of the energies. So, that is the subject matter. Going on to the next chapter, we're going to hear about the different topics which are going to be discussed. Narada inquired from his father all of... inquired from his father of the universe after seeing him well satisfied. So Narada wants to hear about everything in detail from his father. And Prabhupada talks about the school teacher is not like that. Guru is not like a school teacher just giving information just to get some Guru Dakshin or something like that. I remember when Bhakti Charu's book, Bhakti Charu Swami wrote his biography, he described after he was initiated, he told Prabhupada, he said, Srila Prabhupada, I don't have any dakshin to give you. I don't have any money. And Srila Prabhupada said, oh, that's all right. You're giving your whole life. So that's nice. Some people... Most people, they don't want to give their whole life. They just want to give some action. Then Prabhupada also mentions, one who is now the disciple is the next spiritual master. So that's an important point. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu urged everyone to become spiritual master. Whoever knows the signs of Krishna, they should go out and they should become guru by the order of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. What is the qualification of a spiritual master? That he's been trained by another spiritual teacher. He must have heard from another spiritual teacher. 
and then because he's heard nicely and studied nicely, he goes on to become a spiritual teacher. Just like the good students at school go on to become teachers, so in a similar manner, those people who are good, obedient, and sub, uh, enthusiastic in the service of the spiritual teacher, they become the spiritual teacher in the future. Of course, when we were with Prabhupada, we never thought like that. We never thought Prabhupada would ever leave us. You know, I thought, I always thought Prabhupada had a divine body. I couldn't imagine Prabhupada ever leaving us. Prabhupada writes in the purport here, text 43, the so-called formal spiritual master and disciple are not facsimiles of Brahma and Narada or Narada and Vyas. The relationship between Brahma and Narada is reality, while the so-called formality is the relation between the cheater and the cheated. It is clearly mentioned here that Narada is not only well-behaved, meek and obedient, but also self-controlled. One who is not self-controlled, specifically in sex life, can become neither a disciple nor a spiritual master. And then Prabhupada goes on to speak about the qualification, that it's not just only physical presence, but we have to actually show our determination to control the mind and senses and to stick to the proper principles. So Narada then asks, uh, what well, mentions here about the ten characteristics of Srimad Bhagavatam. And they had been heard by Lord Brahma. And now they're going to be, they were also passed from Lord Brahma to his son, Narada. So Prabhupada makes the point that these ten subject matters are all there within the four verses of Srimad Bhagavatam. It's not that something new was added, but the four verses of Srimad Bhagavatam they also include all of the ten different topics of Srimad Bhagavatam. And that will be explained. Srimad Bhagavatam, being the sound representation of the Lord, is simultaneously explained in four verses and in four billion verses, all the same, inasmuch as the Lord is smaller than the atom and bigger than the unlimited sky. Such is the potency of Srimad Bhagavatam. And this way Prabhupada explains his point that everything is there. The Lord is unlimited. So then the scene switches, it's now we're hearing about Narada instructing Srimad Bhagavatam to Srila Vyasadev. Srila Vyasadev is on the banks of the river Saraswati. So his son is Ashram at the bank of the river Saraswati. And Narada Muni, his spiritual master, has come there to speak Srimad Bhagavatam to him and to guide him in this matter. And then finally, we hear Sugadeva Goswami speaking to Maharaj Parikshit, O oh, King, your question as to how the universe came from the gigantic form, how the universe manifested from the gigantic form of the Personality of Godhead, as well as other questions 
I shall answer in detail by explanation of the four verses already mentioned. All right? So this takes us up to chapter 10, which we can look at tomorrow. Are there some questions? Yes? Someone has a hand up here? Yes, take Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, my voice is audible. Yes, I can hear you. Please accept my humble obeisances, Maharaj. Maharaj, I wanted to ask uh, that the lecture which you were mentioning of Rameshwar Prabhu, can we have a link to that? If we can hear that, if I can hear that. Well, it's a lecture he gave on Ram Nomi. So that was just yesterday. In Mayapur? Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. It's televised. Uh -huh. We were talking about how Sukadeva Goswami was Brahmarata. Maharaj Parikshit was Vishnu Rata, Sukadev Goswami is Brahma Rata. So we, we did some research and we checked it out and it does describe how the Lord came and spoke to Sukadeva Goswami when he was when, within the womb of the mother. There's some con contradictory statements. One statement said he was in the womb 11 years. Another statement said he was in the womb 16 years. But anyway, the Lord had come and assured him by hearing Srimad Bhagavatam that he can be delivered. And he can come out. He doesn't have to fear the material energy. <coughs> so that was how he got the name Brahma Ratha. Yes, another question is there from Chittahari Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj, my question was, uh, as Prabhupada mentions here, that all kinds of people, uh, even up to animals, they, they can be you know, connected to Krishna consciousness and they should be given the opportunities. There is no need to consider the qualification. And your holiness mentioned in this matter that you know, how the management will take it. But Tropa says it. And uh, so I was just thinking that uh, sometimes we also say that first we should save them, you know, <clears throat> like uh, who are interested in being saved. So in our preaching uh, movement especially, we try to like youth reaching, try to bring those students who are interested so that we can take them to long run in Krishna <coughs> consciousness. So I just needed your comments and guidance on that. We should take it. Yes, uh, you know, Prabhupada, although he's written like that, Prabhupada also was concerned about different qualities of devotees. And there is a statement, Prabhupada said, no lazies and no crazies. Krishna consciousness is for everyone, but not for lazy people and not for crazy people. So we do have some kind of uh, restrictions, you know. We have to be practical in the sense that you're maintaining an institution. And while we do give people who are lazy and crazy, we give them some mercy. We won't give them the same kind of facility, the same opportunity as we give to a more qualified person. So we have to understand everything in a practical manner. It's not that it's a universal, the same for everyone. Some people we give very nice, we make some special uh, efforts to bring them. Like Prabhupada certainly encouraged us to preach to the students. And he said that the students, they can be the good devotees in the future. If you, if you can educate them while they're still young, Prabhupada did want the, the, the intelligent people, young people educated, 
would be given the opportunity for spiritual education. So, yes, we do make arrangements to encourage people like that. Other people, yeah, we can also give them mercy, but we'll give some special mercy. Let's just like in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, Samoham Sarva Bhuteshu Namidvesho Yebajanti Tumam Bhaktam Maite Te Shuchapyaham. Right? That, there's a difference. You know, somebody, Krishna is equal to everyone, but he's especially inclined to those who give him service. And Prabhupada said, this is natural. So if we see some real sincerity from people, then we will give them some special facilities to encourage their devotional service. Thank you. We have to be practical in organizing the Krishna consciousness movement. We can't just... <laughs> and just like uh, some, you have people like life members, you know, you have to receive them nicely. So I know in Calcutta, when they have Rathiatra, at the time of Rathiatra, they'll have a special reception for the donors and they'll give special gifts and so on for the different donors and they're given some special puja. So service should be appreciated. And similarly with, with students, bringing students into Krishna consciousness, we want to make arrangements for them that they can come into Krishna consciousness. So, we, we're not rejecting people, but we, we do see that some people are more, they're, they're more uh, able to give service, and to offer service than other people. And we try to give more facility for them that they can come into Krishna consciousness. At the same time, we don't want to be taken advantage of. We do encourage them to show that reciprocation by their own sincerity. <coughs> so it's, this is management, this is the expertise of management. Yeah. Organizing these things not very easy thing. I think people in India are doing quite well. I see a lot of new people, a lot of young people coming to the temple there. It's very encouraging, very nice to see. Okay, any other question? Maharaj, I wanted to ask that uh, why these four verses are called Chatur Shloki Bhagavatam? Why are they called Chatur Shloki Bhagavatam? Like these verses, why why are they emphasized so much? Like before starting, we're telling that it's Chatur Shloki. So I have always heard in lectures, but why are they called like? Are they the four main ascents of the of Bhagavatam? So why are they called like this? Yes, they are. Just we just heard just at the last verse here today that uh, Lord Brahma is going to <coughs> the to understand more of about the creation and the teachings, the message of Srimad Bhagavatam, the four verses are going to be expanded and explained in different ways that it's mentioned there. In the last purport of the text, it says, the answers depend on uh, uh, the ten divisions of Srimad Bhagavatam, as explained by Sukadeva Goswami, the, are the limitation of all questions, and intelligent people will derive all intellectual benefits from them by proper utilization. And in the verse itself, it's mentioned, uh, Sukadeva Goswami is telling Maharaj Parikshit, he said, uh, 
manifested from the gigantic form of the personality of Godhead. Oh, yeah, the question is, one of the questions which had been asked earlier by Maharaj Parikshit, how the universe was manifested from the personal form of Krishna. So he said, I will answer in detail by explanation of the four verses already mentioned. And Prabhupada said, there's no difference between these four verses and four billion verses. All the information is in. And just like we should understand, every word in the Srimad Bhagavatam can have so many meanings. When Lord Chaitanya was explaining the Atmarama Sloka, he could explain each word in so many different meanings. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya even couldn't begin to explain all the meanings which Lord Chaitanya offered. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was amazed when he heard Lord Chaitanya explain the Atmarama Sloka. So here also, these four verses, the Chatur Sloki, they explain all the questions which Everything which, you, which can be known, which needs to be asked, which needs to be known, it's all here. It's all within these four verses. Maharaj so, Shukdev Goswami will uh, only expand these four verses in the later chapters? Yeah, he's going to expand them. He won't refer to them again, but he won't refer to them. But you understand what the information which he's given, which he's using, is based on the information which comes from these four verses. This is, you have to understand that he said these uh, Sukadeva Goswami, what was it here? The great speaker Srila Sukadeva Goswami, oh, the, the, the ten divisions of Srimad Bhagavatam, as explained by Sukadeva Goswami, are the limitation of all questions. So everything is going to be explained from these four verses, which we've already discussed. The four verses, the forms of the Lord in transcendence and in matter, and the Lord's energies, material and spiritual, maya and yoga maya, how the Lord plays with his energies, and the process. So I, I explained the Vedic literatures can be summarized in three divisions of knowledge. There's Sambandha, Abhidaya, and Prayojana Gyans. And Sambandha, the knowledge of the relationship between the Lord and the living entity. Ab Abhidaya, the process of devotional service, and Prayojana, the goal of devotional service. So the Chatur Sloki describe these four different levels of knowledge. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so then we'll finish here today. Juti, Gopi, Mataji. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. Go back to Brinda, Ki Jai.